Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that we're on Ngunnawal Nambri land and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So uh, just to note as well, Tony and I are going to be presenting this, um, this work, but we're, we're also working with Professor Julian Webb and Professor Susan Ainsworth from the um, University of Melbourne on, on this research. Uh, Julian's at Melbourne Law School, but Susan's in sort of organisational psychology management area. So um, we four have written a short article for the Law Institute Journal in Victoria, which is coming out in October, which more or less um, puts what we're going to be putting to you today. Um, so really interested in feedback and your ideas at, at the end of the session. And thank you very much, everyone, for coming. So uh, we all know that it's a problem in the legal profession, and it seems to be um, that it's worse in the legal profession than in workplaces generally. In other words, the incidence of it is higher. And this comes out of various recent reports, um, including um, the one that Kieran, who's, who's in the audience, um, wrote the, uh, the International Bar Association asked to report. Also, the Victorian Legal Services Board and Commissioner did a report in 2019 where they um, talked to a lot of people in Victoria. Um, there was the more recent review of sexual harassment in Victorian courts this year by Helen Zoke, and also the South Australian Equal Opportunity Commissioner review of harassment in the South Australian legal profession, all of which paint a fairly dismal picture. Um, the reason that it seems to be worse in legal workplaces um, seems to be to do with hierarchy. The, these are three um, risk factors that the uh, Australian Human Rights Commission Respect at Work report noted. Um, so these, they said that sexual harassment is more likely if these factors are at play in the workplace. And of course, all three factors are relevant for uh, legal workplaces. Um, the other thing that uh, Julian Webb has noted um, is that unlike in the respect of work report, which reported that harassers were often your sort of your work peers, it seems that in the legal profession, the harassing is more likely to come from those who are holding senior roles. Um, and so they're har harassing more junior staff. It also seems that, that anyway, in 2019, when the Victorian Legal Services Board and Commissioner did their review, um, that legal employers are not very cognizant of the magnitude of the problem. Hopefully they're a bit more cognizant now, but at that stage, 73% of Victorian managers who were surveyed thought that sexual harassment was very rare within their own organisation. So as Tony pointed out, presumably they think it's all only a problem for their competitors, which of course is not the case. So Tony's going to talk about where we're at now after all these reports and all this work. Thanks very much, Viv. So, so that's a great uh, scene setting. So. Um... As Viv said, um, there's a higher prevalence in the legal profession workplaces than even the dire position with respect to Australian workplaces generally. So um, more than two thirds of women in legal workplaces report sexual harassment. Um, Kate Jenkins' report, which is probably the, the most live of those reports that uh, uh, Vivian flagged um, that respected work uh, produced um, probably as you know the the, uh, the Commonwealth government's roadmap for respect and as part of that roadmap there's a uh, a bill currently before the the, the Senate uh, sexual discrimination and fair work respected work amendment act um, which is currently being debated but uh, commentary on that bill um, shows two things, I think. Firstly, or two salient things. Firstly, that uh, there seems to be a watering down of what Jenkins recommended in her report 
um, further watering down from what the government roadmap provided in the in the legislation in that there's to, the legislation proposes a, um, a imposing a, a threshold for a definition of sex-based harassment that there be something called seriously demeaning uh, something in the order of seriously demeaning nature in terms of the behavior not not just the perception of harassment by the person who's been subject to it so that's the first problem. The second is that, um, as Jenkins suggested and, and was quite firm in suggesting, there's nothing that seems to move the conversation away from a response to uh, individual disclosures by survivors of harassment to impose instead a positive duty on, on uh, employers to take reasonable measures to eliminate uh, harassment. So there's some activity in that space, but potentially it might be disappointing activity. Maybe just the next slide, Viv, I think. Um, with respect then more closely to the, to the uh, legal profession, um, I, I, it, I think there's potentially more um, scope for successful movement in the legal profession because, because of potentially reputational uh, damage or reputational gain for for legal firms. So uh, a focus in some of the um, responses to the reports, etc., that Vivian um, flagged is that the development of good practice indicators, which which uh, legal firms in particular would be required to follow, and if they had followed, then they they would be in a position to be to assert that they had that they had made some progress in terms of um, um, eradicating a culture which condones uh, sexual harassment or, or bullying. And secondly, some provisions um, for enhanced and mandatory reporting by employers of, um, of, of complaints and uh, complaints made by um, people who'd been harassed. And that, that has the potential of some strength because there's a specific rule under the Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules with, res with respect to harassment that could be used as a lever. Um, I'll come back to that, but potentially at the profession level, there's more hope for some reg effective regulatory reform than more broadly. Thanks, Deb. So we wanted to take you back to something the IBA report says about sexual harassment and bullying, because you may remember that it looks at both those issues and talks about their interrelationship. And that is that this behaviour, sexual harassment and bullying, doesn't occur in a vacuum. That related issues are mental health challenges, lack of work satisfaction and insufficient diversity in the workplace. And the reason I wanted to highlight that is because it ties in with some research that uh, Stephen Tang and Tony and I did, um, which was the research you might have seen, it was written up in the um, Georgetown Journal of Legal Ethics last year, but actually it took us a long, long time to get there. So um, it was done so a few years ago now, the actual survey. Um, we're not, so I wanted to take you back to that because this is where our idea about the intersection between focusing on ethical climate and the problem of sexual harassment and bullying comes from. So I uh, wanted to point out here the types of practices from which the participants came, that they were very junior, so we were interested in the perceptions of newly admitted lawyers. Um, and we're not saying that they were representative, but it was an interesting, you know, it was a, it was a decent sample of junior lawyers that we looked at. Um, and we asked them about their perceptions of ethical climate in their workplace. And basically that means, what is your perception of how the people in power in your workplace, the people who have responsibility to make decisions, how do they make them? And what, what sort of fell out of the data was that that the junior employees had three main um, perceptions of the ethical climate type, if you like. There, there were those who thought their managers made these sorts of decisions because of considerations of power and self-interest. Those who were 
sort of led by their own integrity and responsibility and those who had an ethic of care. And these three factors weren't mutually exclusive. So you could have more of one or the other. And, and of course they could overlap. But just to explain those a bit more, um, you'll see that the power and self-interest where power and control, instrumental outcomes valued over honesty. Um, integrity and responsibility brings in adherence to rules and norms. An ethic of care um, focuses on interpersonal relationship and respectful relationship. So um, the wonderful Stephen Tang was able with his, with his psychology um, degree and the statistical skills that came with that, he was able to use what's called exploratory factor analysis to, with the data to work out that the, there were three main ways in which these perceptions came together. So a junior employee in the first group that we've lined, which, which we've noted as ethical apathy, apathy, a typical member of that group was, was perceiving that there was a significant lack of integrity and responsibility. So that's the left side, you see it's minus 1.10, 1.1. So a significant lack of integrity and responsibility, um, not a lot of power and self-interest, but not much ethic of care of either. So we, we named that an ethical apathy type climate. The getting ahead climate, so the perception of that from the junior employee was significant concern about power and self-interest, very little in negative integrity and responsibility and even more negative ethic of care. So even less ethic of care. And then the positive balance was, um, as you can see, it wasn't, um, it wasn't strikingly ideal because the integrity and responsibility rating there is not all that high, but it's, it is in the positive zone as is the ethic of care and the power and self-interest is in the negative zone. So those were the, the three main, what we call ethical time, climate types, the epic, ethical apathy, getting ahead and positive balance um, that, that came out of the data. Um, and this was, the, this was how many people, how many junior employees felt that they were in an ethical climate of positive balance as opposed to ethical apathy and getting ahead. The good news there being that a bit more than half felt they were in the positive balance, but you know, 45% and the others not is not great news either. So the implications in, in our research of this were the following: that if you were in an ethical apathy type climate, your your likelihood of, of um, having a score on the DAS, which is depression anxiety stress scores. So your likelihood of depression, if you were in ethical apathy was here. Um, and if it were, if you were in a, a climate that you, that was the getting ahead climate, it was up here. So you can see that you were 3.4 times more likely to have symptoms of depression if you were in a getting ahead ethical climate than if you were in a positive balance ethical climate. Um, so anxiety, 2.4 times more likely to, to have symptoms of anxiety if in the ethical apathy climate than in the positive balance climate. And stress was a bit, lost, bit less startling, but even so, twice as likely to have symptoms of depression or anxiety if you were in um, either the ethical apathy or the getting ahead climate than the positive balance climate. So I hope you can take that all in, but basically, I suppose in a nutshell, if you're in an if you're in an ethical apathy climate or a getting ahead climate, it's not very good news for your mental health. Um, and likewise, interestingly, for your job satisfaction. So, I if you've ever heard of self development theory, autonomy, competence, and relatedness are all part of self-development theory and they're important um, factors in our mental health. And you'll see that that people, that 
people scored better on both all three of those factors in the positive balanced climate. Um, likewise, their job satisfaction, their career satisfaction was better. And also their organisational learning was better. And again, organisational learning is interestingly related to mental health um, factors, but I won't, haven't got time to go into that now. So all in all, I mean, again, just the nutshell being the same, that being in an ethical, sorry, in a positive balance type ethical climate is much better for your mental health, your job satisfaction and your career satisfaction. Um, so our hypothesis is that there's probably a strong link between some ethical types of ethical climate and sexual harassment and bullying, because taking you back to that slide I showed at the beginning, as the IBA report reminds us, sexual harassment and bullying don't occur in a vacuum, um, and, it, and that there are overlaps with mental health concerns, um, job satisfaction concerns and the diversity of the workplace. Um, and then also the respect at work, you may remember one of the risk factors was having a strong hierarchy where people in had significant power over junior staff. And of course that correlates really strongly to our power and self-interest ethical climate type. So that's, so that's our hypothesis and that's what the work that Tony and I and Julian and Susan have started on now. So back to you, Tony. Thanks very much, Viv. Um, it's, um, it's useful to hear Viv's uh, description, which I've needless to say, I've heard a number of times, but um, it's a good, good understand. I think it gives a good understanding of, of the benefit of doing some empirical work because as Vivian indicated, it was, it was a, it was a job of work to get 300 odd newly admitted lawyers to talk to us and do some survey work etc but that then allowed us to sort of conceptualize a number of as vivian's indicated a number of different sort of ethical climates that or cultures that they were finding themselves in in the early part of their career and and then to make the assertion or make the the um, uh, um, assertion that um one of those ethical climates that they they described that is one that was a balanced uh, uh, ethical climate was in fact beneficial to their uh, mental health and a number of the other um, climates they found themselves in particularly sort of a, a climate that emphasized power and self-interest was 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 detrimental to their, their their mental health so it's 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 nice to have, I guess, the empirical data to make that sort of assertion. And, it, and what flowed from that was the next step that we would take in that project, for instance, is to say, well, wouldn't it be useful to be able to um, create an ethical climate in a law firm that was of that nature that would affect positively the, the mental health of um, lawyers in the early part of their their uh, their practice and we made some some suggestions about how that might be regulated to produce that so to use that comparison we're, we're making a similar as Viv's outlined a similar sort of assertion about um, uh, ethical um, climate in legal workplaces as to what effect that would have uh, or what effect that does have uh, on the prevalence of sexual harassment in, and bullying in workplaces. So as I've put there, there are two questions. The first is to try and do the same sort of exercise to, to establish some empirical basis for the, for the linking that if you can, uh, that poor ethical uh, climate where there's a prevalence of, of breaking or bending ethical rules is one where there's similarly a higher prevalence of sexual harassment some way of establishing an empirical basis for that assertion and then secondly if if we do establish that basis if we find some but some basis upon which to make that assertion then what can we say about um, what sort of form of regulation might be put into place um, for the legal profession in a similar way to the assertion we made with respect to to, uh, to mental health 
that that can have positive effects in in this case on the prevalence uh, of um, of the occurrence of sexual harassment and, and bullying or the, the the prevalence of a culture that either condones or or brushes that that uh, behavior aside as as not sufficiently serious um so I, ju I just want to say just one or two things about each of those questions and then i'd be i'd be very pleased to hear some comments and and questions if you have them so firstly how might we investigate that that um uh that first question um, two of our researchers are based in Melbourne. We've had some contact over the last years with the Legal Services Commissioner in, in, in uh, Victoria, and they've been interested in our prior research about mental health and clearly the question of sexual harassment um, and uh, bullying is, is uh, foremost on their mind at the moment. So there's a possibility that um, we would look to them um, to be the the uh, the source of um, people that we could interview or people we could survey in the in the, uh, the profession, one who've made disclosures of sexual harassment, um, whether we could then speak to them as we've done in the past about uh, getting some insight into the ethical climate in which they find themselves to see if there's a similar link. Uh, that, that, we're, that we're asserting that uh, between a, a poor ethical climate and the prevalence of sexual harassment. So that's, that's the empirical question. And the second question then is, well, if we're sufficiently confident to make that assertion that there is a connection, what can we say in terms of, in terms of regulation for the legal profession that, that might be effective? Uh, and just one idea about that is, um, an example that we turned to when we were dealing with a mental health question about how you regulate for a particular culture. Uh, New South Wales um, uh, Legal Services Commission for a, a brief time, uh, a number of years ago under its legislation, had a requirement that was um, for legal firms who wish to move to incorporated practice. Uh, and I think if I took a guess, maybe other people here might know better than I, but I think maybe 40% of the profession might be in that form now. Um, and in order to, to, to be able to, to make that move, there was a, a, a self-reporting requirement for the whole of the firm to essentially do a, a, an ethical audit on, on its practice uh, in order to be able to, to, um, to take that form of uh, incorporation. Uh, and um, that that became a requirement for the for the um, uh, for the move to incorporation. Um, sadly, that requirement disappeared. Large law firms were unhappy with the addi additional regulatory burden. But when it was in operation, what it did show was that it it, it provided quite an uh, quite a substantial insight into the ethical climate of firm of the firms that were under. Uh, under incorporation, particularly uh, in terms of the survey answers and survey data that was obtained from both professional staff and junior staff. A bit like Vivian said at the start, that some 70% of um, ma managers in legal professions think that there, there, isn't, a, there isn't a prevalence of uh, sexual harassment and bullying in my workplace. Similarly, uh, um, managers were unaware of some of the ethical problems that uh, junior lawyers and support staff indicated that were highly prevalent in, in their firms, but were una they were unaware of it. So, so that form of insight was potentially one that could produce some, we think, uh, if it was regulated for, could produce some cultural change in law firms. Vivian, I won't, I won't say any more than that, but if you're happy to go to questions, I am. Yeah, sure. So I, I might stop sharing so we can see people. I'm also happy to moderate this if it makes it easier. If there's questions come in the chat, I can let you know. Great, thank you, Damien. So we're, we're very interested, not just in your questions, but uh, you know, your responses generally, and also ideas about as Tony was talking about, well, how do we take this from theory to um, some sort of evidence? 
Anthony? Um, yeah, look, thanks. That's really fascinating and nice to be taken through that research it did and to hear that it's been published in Georgetown. Um, I, I was just, just trying to clarify, it might be a clarification question, but also a suggestion. Was the idea with going the, creating the new empirical research that you would uh, only be surveying people who had reported? Is that what I heard rightly, that you might get access to those who've reported some form of bullying or sexual harassment and then use them as the foundation of determining whether they were in an, what ethical climate their firm was or their, their, uh, their position within the profession was? I suppose you happy to answer this, Viv? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I, I, I guess there are two approaches, Anthony. One is to do just what you said um, for the Legal Services Commission to give us to put us in touch with people who've made disclosures and then we would ask those people who've made disclosures to use this um, modified simplified instrument that we created for the purpose of the mental health survey to to do that uh, to use that instrument and then we would then make an, an assessment about using the conceptualizations we we produced last time to say well that person is sitting in a firm that we 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 think has the hallmarks of one, mm. which is ethical apathy, for instance. So that's one approach. And then then if there's some prevalence of consistency of of that matching, that might suggest okay, there's something to be said for addressing ethical climate. The other the other is to not wait for people to to um, to make disclosures, but to to find a group of subjects as we did in the past and, and survey them in that duplication. So with the with the ethical climate index and with, and there are a number of readily available um, uh, survey instruments that assess in terms of scenario based, the prevalence of, of sexual harassment in a workplace. So, so people who haven't reported, but could give us an insight into their firm's um, um, the presence in their firms of a particular ethical climate and the prevalence in their firms of sexual harassment and bullying and then then make a similar connection. So there's two possible ones. Yeah, and so I think that speaks to what, where I was going to go with. So thanks for the clarification. I mean, it strikes me that that second one that you've described enables you to almost sort of replicate what you did, but add in this extra dimension almost to the ethical climate and then look for the chorus, you know, correspondence. And I think it arises out of what you just said too, that, that, you know, you could survey a large number of people um, who are not prepared to report sexual harassment, but are very happy to speak or maybe not speak, but if you could, if it's anonymous and they have the right level of sort of guarantee around anonymity, to speak about the, if you like, sexual harassment and bullying climate of their workplace. And I would think there's an argument for that being, particularly because it would then mimic the work you've already done. It would just be adding whether this is the right way to talk about that extra dimension, which seemed to me intuitively that, that you know, that, that would be the way to go. But I'm, I'm definitely interested in what any other, anyone else suggests or what you think. That, that's great for you, one, one thing I'd say just about the, the former is that I would think the Legal Services Commissioner, Commission would be looking to have sort of a response and a care package that they would they would reach out to people who've made disclosures. Mm. Uh, and it may be that there would be some benefit as part of that package, if you if you like, for, for people to be given the opportunity to say something about the ethical yeah. the ethical context. So so there's there's Classes on both sides, I guess. But thank you for the comment. Oh, and sorry, I don't want to take up too much time, but I, I think that, that that is actually, you know, super important, even in terms of a therapeutic response, that they might be able to see that they're participating in something that could bring about a systemic change, which leads me to the point of suggesting you do both. But anyway. Okay, thank you. <laughs> right. uh, it's Peter here. I, I think um, yeah. Sorry, Peter, Adele had her hand up, had her hand up for a while. We'll come to you next. 
Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. And thank you for such a, a really helpful and clear presentation. Um, I'm interested in the, um, the, the form of regulation through ethical self-assessment. And thank you, Tony. I note your comment that these are readily available. Is, um, is there any, where might um, be able to source those self-assessment tools? Sorry, Adele, I just didn't pick up what, which particular the, um, um, the New South Wales self-assessment tool, you know. Okay, so we, we can give you a link to this. A couple of good commentaries, a um, couple of good commentary, a um, uh, couple of good commentary articles about about that from a, a couple of colleagues, um, Susan Parker and, and Susan, Christine Parker and others that, that we can direct you to. So we'll, 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 I'll make a note of that, Dylan. Tony, that's very kind of you. I really appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Pleasure. So, Peter, go ahead. Thanks. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I think this may have been the point made by Anthony, but it, or it may be a slightly different one. But it would be fascinating to actually uh, look at the group that's that has complained with a with a, uh, just a general sample as well, and and just compare those two groups. Um, but the point I wanted to sort of make generally is that um, it's this sounds eminently fundable, and um, obviously, uh, if not the uh, law society itself in Victoria, perhaps the law foundation, which I think probably still exists. We're hoping it's fundable. Um, uh, um, Julian Webb has quite good um, contacts with the with the Victorian Commissioner, so. Yeah, we're hoping something will come of that. But yes, the Law Foundation's a good idea. Thanks, Peter. So I, I haven't been closely looking at the chat. Is there anything there, Damien, that we uh, should... Yeah, well, Cam did mention that he um, has done a seminar recently on uh, what I believe is the New South Wales Act. So that he said that he would take that discussion offline. Um, I'm not sure if he's still online. Maybe he had to leave already and that's why it's there. Uh, but uh, he seemed to indicate that he would be happy to discuss it with you. Um, uh, the recent FW Act amendment, so it's not the New South Wales Act, so apology. Uh, so yeah, um, so maybe that's one to follow up. Um, but maybe I'll abuse my position and speak about, um, ask a question instead then. Um, because I'm wondering about, um, like, you know, the, I mean, the last slide, yeah, the last point around regulatory interventions and much like where your thoughts are on that. Um, and like, I mean, what could you actually provide? Because it seems to me that, I mean, like transparency is going to help a lot here. A lot of it, a lot of the, I mean, it may like help with some sort of a culture change because putting a light on a situation in a particular form um, may, um, I suppose, shift uh, a balance in the firm to make positive changes. So are your regulatory, your thoughts about regulatory interventions largely linked to kind of reporting duties and even something to do with kind of ranking different, I mean, you could even go as far as ranking different law firms as uh, positive workplace environments and stuff like that. So I'm just wondering how far uh, down that line of regulatory uh, interventions uh, that you've actually thought about that. And, I mean, what are, what are the, the types of things that you're thinking about? Well, we're not very far down the line, I should say. It's, um, it, it, uh, it is a bit of a quandary, and I, I really welcome Kieran's views on this as well. Um, Susan Ainsworth, who's the sort of organisational management psychology um, expert, is, you know, has pointed out that regulation can sort of um, sometimes have the opposite effect of what you want it to have, and so it has to be very carefully thought out. Um, there is an interesting debate at the moment within the profession about um, mandatory reporting, not just interestingly of sexual harassment and bullying. Um, this came out of the, um, the Victorian Royal Commission into Lawyer X, you know, the Nicola Gobbo instance, and the commissioner there 
recommended that there be mandatory reporting by lawyers of other lawyers, lawyers misbehavior, which would of course capture sexual harassment and bullying, which as Tony pointed out is um, contrary to this, the conduct rules. Um, I know that uh, the law society, the law institute in Victoria has is surveying its members at the moment about that, but their own the institute's attitude at the moment is that it would backfire and that it wouldn't work. So, um, so that's the, you know that and and it might push stuff underground in some way or another. Um, so you know where that's sort of. We're talking about that, but certainly haven't reached a conclusion on that yet. Um, Tony, did you want to add anything in here? Uh, yeah, yeah, I agree. With, I agree with what Viv says, and and thanks for the question, Tony, because that because you're quite right. We get, I mean, we do the empirical work to be able to suggest there's a connection between um, ethical climate and and certain negative factors. So, and and um, I guess the flip side of that that there's um a can there's there is a correlation between some between positive certain sorts of positive ethical climate that we're able to identify from what people tell us uh, and and positive things such as better mental health but then the question then it gets to the stage of okay how do you uh, how do you in fact proactively create that good ethical climate and that's that's you know, we, we've often got to that stage and, and uh, you know, sort of we've reached the, the nub of the problem and it, 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 it is sizable. I mean, my, my thoughts are, as I flagged perhaps at the start, I, I do see a lot of, a lot of real benefit in, in Kate Jenkins' emphasis on, on uh, imposing a positive uh, obligation on employers. So they so they're not just waiting in response to have complaints and then they're being responsive to complaints, even if they, even if the response um, is positive, even if people who are harassing are are, are fired from the firm, or, or uh, even if there's there's positive action, it shouldn't really be at that end. It should be at the the, the positive obligation end to not create the climate. Um, that condones um, or turns a blind eye to, to sexual harassment. And, and, uh, and that's probably the focus, I think, of the regulatory you know, emphasis. And I am heartened about the possible benefit of sort of soft regulation in terms of just what you were saying about um, uh, best practice indicators. Um, you know, legal firms have signed up to a lot of those in the past, and they 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 may appear to be sort of box ticking, ticking, but I don't think they necessarily need to be just just that. That a positive indicator of uh, we survey our firm um, or external people survey our firm, and, and it shows that there's a, a very low prevalence of sexual harassment. Um, I, I think that's that's a good marketing tool for legal firms, particularly large law firms. Uh, and and the second is what I flagged about New South Wales um, uh, experiment with uh, in in the area of, of uh, incorporated legal practice. Um, it's unfortunate that uh, that was knocked on the head after only a couple of years, but that was quite surprisingly an effective self-regulatory tool, which you would think is that is there a place for self-regulation when the the occurrence of Sexual harassment and bullying in law firms is is has a reported uh, um, uh, prevalence of, of more than two thirds of, of women in in legal firms. Is is there a place for self regulation? Well, I, I think there is if it's effective. So it's more those sorts of things than perhaps broad uh, regulation in in terms of the the um, you know the stick I suppose in the responsive mm. stick that. Than, than, than these sorts of measures. The other thing, just quickly before we go to the questions, is um, from Kieran and, and then Anthony, um, is that statistic we mentioned from the Victorian um, research was that 73 of legal managers, sorry, 73% of legal managers surveyed didn't think sexual harassment was happening in their organisation. 
which you know was happening at next door but not here and that's part of the beauty of the self assessment scheme that did that was in new south wales for a short time was that it actually got the conversation going amongst senior managers and they learned things about their organization um, because they were talking to people that that they didn't know so it's it's sort of getting that conversation going and getting the and also in research that Christine Parker did in Queensland um, showed that the senior managers thought, oh yeah, my door's always open, you know, there's no ethical problems here. Whereas that was not the perception of Hundreds of girls have contacted the CPJ. Sorry, Wayne, can you mute it? Sorry. Apologies. No worries. <laughs> um, that it was not the experience of the junior people in the organisation, that there was quite a, dis a difference in perception between the junior staff and the senior staff about what was actually going on. So yes. getting that conversation going within an organisation um, is partly what this, the New South Wales experience pointed to the power of, I suppose. So Kieran, let's go to you. Just to say on the regulatory point, um, I've recently done some work for the IBA where we've surveyed 70 regulators around the world on their approach to bullying and harassment and that report will be coming out in the next month or two and, and should hopefully shed some more insight on how different regulators are responding. But I think it's my broader perspective that the regulators are having a difference, making a difference, certainly in places like the UK and New Zealand and, and in Australia where regulators have been really and robust in in seeking to improve their response to inappropriate behaviour. I think that is shifting the dial in uh, firms, particularly. Um, and I think we're just going to probably see a period of, of regulatory innovation where regulators try and consider how best to grapple with these issues. Um, I suspect you know that's what we'll see in the next few uh, next few years. Yeah, interesting. We're also seeing discipline cases about it, which, you know, 20 years ago, we didn't say. Um, Anthony. Um, I was going to say, I'm happy for Stephen to go first, given the time, but I'll, I'll just, it was more like unpacking the original uh, study that you did and wondering, you flagged that power, and I think this came out of the IBA report, you know, um, and looking at power is going to be one of the key aspects. What I'm wondering about is whether or not there was a correlation between positive ethical climate and the type of workplace, because you categorise them into community, government and private, and whether or not your data indicated that, for example, ethical climate was more likely to be positive in one or the other. But it strikes me there are interesting questions about whether the way perhaps power is exercised or the way the, the structures of various you know, whether it's a government or a private or a community legal sector organisations may have relationships. And there might be ones we're not expecting um, in relation to ethical climate and sexual harassment climate. So going to that next level. Yeah. So, yes, I mean, Tony, bite in here if you want to, but there was, there was a correlation between practice type and the, the ethical climate types, but it wasn't all that like it wasn't as significant as other correlations. And one of the most um, important ones was the organizational learning atmosphere, you know, culture. So if, so, um, if you're a private practice, although you are slightly more likely to be, you know, in the negative climate area because you're a private practice, if you had really good organizational learning culture and strategies then that shifted you way over onto the pos into the positive end so so and so yeah so to answer your question yes there was some correlation but it wasn't as significant as other factors Tony, and that, yeah. i was just going to say that's fascinating viv too and um just that sense that it's all about the way the organization is set up in terms of learning around this stuff which think offers so much promise then in terms of how you might regulate. Yeah. Stephen? Sorry, just before we go to you, Kieran, I did want to say, I don't know if you're still here, but thank you very much for letting us know about that report. I think I sort of skipped over that, but that'll be fascinating reading. So Stephen, sorry to you. 
I, I put my hand down because Anthony asked my question for me. Oh, right. uh, like, but I, I, I just just make the observation, listening to your description about Viv about the different um, uh, perceptions of what is going on in in the workplace. I was just uh, reminded of uh, Andrew Cuomo's recent uh, explanation for for his behaviour, um, uh, which uh, you know I think so, says a lot about the challenges that. Uh, uh, work like this faces. Yes, indeed. Um, just to, to just give one small example, Anthony, to um, I th th it wasn't uh, strongly statistically significant, but there was an indication that that in-house lawyers were were a, a particular uh, well, there was a particular prevalence of of the 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 type of culture that Viv uh, had flagged that, that was most productive of, of heightened uh, symptoms of, of mental ill health. So uh, I, I wouldn't make too much of that, but the, you know, there's, there was the opportunity, I guess, to, to dig down into the data a bit further as to whether, whether some legal sort of workplaces are gonna, are gonna be um, worse than others. And, and that's certainly a matter that would come up in in trying to make the correlation between a particular ethical climate and the prevalence of sexual harassment, whether you know whether it, it is particular workplaces, whether it's barristers' chambers, or whether it's you know, judicial um, situations, or or, um, or large law firms, or community legal centres. Um, you know which of those is is a particular side of legal practice uh, showing a, a stronger prevalence of sexual harassment than than other, uh, other legal workplaces. Sorry, I'm on mute. You see, we've obviously solved this issue, so. <laughs> um, I see that uh, Gregor has put a question in the chat. Um, so any observations would extend this to barristers? Uh, good question. Is Tony that... is speaking, but he was muted. So I'm not sure if he'd already uh, thought of an answer. <laughs> OK. Um, yeah, uh, well, that's a good question, as, as Vivian says, Gregor. Um, it's a question of really capturing an audience, I suppose, or capturing a, 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 a potential subjects. Um, it was a long and hard struggle to get 300 odd young lawyers to, um, to um, engage with us. Um, but in terms of the Legal Services Commission, I think the, I, I'd probably stand corrected, but I think certainly in Victoria, the re reports of um, um, misconduct come to that organisation first and then they're doled out to particular parts of the profession. So if that's the case, then if we were taking the, the um, let me see, the first of the avenues I talked to Anthony about in terms of the empirical inquiry, um, then we may well be talking to people who are in, in, uh, uh, in barristers chambers as well as people who are in private or legal firms. Yeah, so it, it would be an interesting uh, comparison, certainly. Yeah, well, thanks, Tony. The, the reason I asked, I guess, is um, you still have the same um, or similar professional association uh, obligations and practicing certificates and all that sort of stuff. So the bar association has a disciplinary function. But what you don't have in the barrister community is the employment relationship because we're we're self-employed essentially. So yeah. um, the dynamics might be a bit different and then. There's also quite a hierarchical sense of if you've got an ethical problem of any kind, you, you ask, you know, the the more senior barristers that you know, uh, if you're if you've just come into it, um, it'll be the people who were your tutors when you're a reader. It might be the more senior members of uh, chambers. Uh, it might be a particular delegate or designate person in the bar association to advise on ethical issues and so on. Um, so I just thought it'd be interesting uh, to extend that um, to, uh, to lawyers outside of firms and, and organisations like that. Thank you.
Yeah, so Akshay has put an interesting um, comment in the chat about an idea from cor corporations law of requiring internal, internal whistleblower mechanisms, um, which would help management learn about these issues. Yeah, so th that is an interesting thing to think about. Um, I assume those could be anonymous or otherwise. Um, that's certainly something for us to look at. Thanks, Akshay. Um, do I mean we might wrap it up? Is that fair enough? Yeah, that's fair enough. I suppose unless anyone has any final questions, I think we're, we're good to end. But, yeah. yeah, thanks very much for this. It was really, really um, excellent presentation. And I mean, it's really nice to see some empirical data as well, which is refreshing. Okay, um, well, thanks, thanks so much for the opportunity. I'm, I'm sure Viv would join with me in saying it's been great for us to do the presentation. Uh, and great to get some feedback about what we might do next. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks for coming. Brilliant, thank you.